Hi friends, welcome to the War Heroes channel. Today, we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. The chief of staff of the 4th Panzer Army landed here in a Fiesler Stork on the 9th July. Its staff had orders to take over command of the 40th Panzer Corps, which was involved in the hard fighting that had developed near Kantamarovka. The chief of staff formed the advance party. He reported that upon the instructions of the high command, the 4th Panzer Army was already on the march to the southeast, which entailed crossing the 6th Army's line of attack. If we were not careful, both armies could get mixed up together, which was why it needed the understanding of our staff. This was soon achieved, and the chief of staff of the Panzer Army was able to continue his flight to the 40th Panzer Corps. This was able to break the Soviet resistance near Kantamaroka. On the 11th July, it reached the Chur near Bokovskaya. On the same day, the 40th Panzer Corps left the command of the 6th Army and came under the 4th Panzer Army. On the 13th July, the whole 4th Panzer Army received orders to turn south from the Chur to block the retreat to the east of the enemy weakened by the 17th Army and 1st Panzer Army to form bridgeheads on the left bank of the Don and finally to take Rostov, together with the 1st Panzer Army. I was already with Paulus for the briefing. He had heard of these measures shortly before. Excitedly, he paced to and fro in the low room. The advantage that the 40th Panzer Corps has achieved has gone. We are still several days. March from the Chur. In this situation, turning the Panzer Corps to the south means that the terrain has to be fought for all over again. We are expected to carry a load that previously four armies would have been allocated general. Unfortunately, that is so. The 6th Army alone is obliged to conduct the attack on the Big Don Bend and at the same time to take over the protection of the northern flank, which will become longer day by day. I have heard from Volter that the 2nd Hungarian Army will take on part of the task, I replied. Correct, Adam. But until now, the majority of the Hungarians are in the area south of Voronezh where they fought in army group weeks, it will take a while for the Hungarian divisions to lead their positions and be able to replace our divisions on the Don. Are we really going to conduct the attack on Stalingrad without tanks? General, according to a previous briefing by the army group, we will get a Panzer Corps again, apparently the 14th, hopefully, straight away. Even a great optimist could not have been confident in the 6th Army's prospects. On the 20th July, we crossed the upper Chur near Bokovskaya, the place that nine days previously had been occupied by the 40th Panzer Corps. Two assault groups were formed for the further thrust into the Don Bend, the northern, one from the 14th Panzer Corps, which had been attached to us in the interim, together with the 8th Corps and the southernmost by the List Corps. The divisions intended to protect the northern flank were placed under the 17th Corps, the spearhead of the 6th Army was now the 14th Panzer Corps. On the 23rd July, its divisions forced their way into the Big Don bend south of Kremenskaya. Within a short time, the Don was reached near Saratinskaya, but yet again, this was a blow into empty space. The enemy had escaped over the Don. Although we had sustained no unusually high casualties since, since the beginning of the offensive, the fighting strength of the infantry was greatly reduced. On average, the infantry companies had a fighting strength of only 60 men. Many of our men were ill as a result of uninterrupted marches that demanded all their strength to extremes. With this came circulatory problems, stomach and bowel. Sicknesses, caused by the unaccustomed steppe climate with its constant big swings in temperature. By day, the quicksilver columns of the thermometers rose to 40 degrees, falling at night to 10 degrees. There was no protective cover for most. Erecting tents for the short rest at night was not worthwhile, but the casualties from the difficult conditions considerably exceeded the fighting casualties. Understandably, my concerns as the army's first adjutant increased. Who would bring up the replacements to close the gaps? I telephoned the adjutant of the army group. Some weak marching companies were established from soldiers who had been released from the field hospitals as recovered and fit for the front. But what were a few hundred replacements when we needed several thousand? I briefed General Paulus on the personnel situation at the evening conference. According to Army Group, the Army should receive some marching companies in the next few days. 
Further replacements are temporarily not available. We have now advanced fighting for about 400 kilometers. Several companies have lost a third of their original fighting strength. Will the army be relieved by a second batch? Or will an army group send us fresh divisions from the reserve? Hollis's mouth formed a bitter smile. If the offensive reaches a certain sector, the pace of the second batch of the reserve will speed up. That is what we learned as tactical instructors at the war school, did we not? I too know nothing else. But I must tell you that neither the one nor the other is available in the fur. Headquarters one believes it possible to throw proven basic rules of strategy and tactics to the winds. The highest command lets itself all too often be led by political and defense economic goals and then believes them capable of achievement by our undoubtedly excellent and experienced troops. But everything has its limits. Our army is overstretched, fought out and seriously weakened should it come to decisive fighting. At the beginning of the attacks, the army group had two German infantry divisions in reserve. The Allies following. Us up should be relieving our divisions on the northern flank, but their fighting strength is only half that of our own, nor are they suitable for the attack. We will have to carry the burden of the fighting for the Volga city on our own. How will this continue then? Our Panzer Corps on the Don is already 150 kilometers ahead of the infantry divisions. That is why we have to strike for the bridges as soon as possible. Apart from that, the front that we have to secure to the north will become even longer. There are not half a dozen divisions remaining for a further attack. Tomorrow, the 24th Panzer Corps, which previously belonged to the 4th, Panzer Army joins us. It will reinforce the right-hand attacking group of the List Corps. But what is that? To fill a hole, one digs up another spot. Paulus's critical intellect as a general staff officer could not escape from Hitler's weaknesses, mediocrity, and fantasies in the conduct of warfare. This gave him concerns that nagged at him. But he was an outright soldier, believing in his knowledge and trust in his divisions hoping to be able to compensate for the failures and faulty planning of the high command. I went back to my tent to work on some recommendations for the Knight's Cross and the German Cross in goal, but I could not get the conversation with Paulus out of my head. If he could only keep his health, for he did not look well, he stood pensively in front of the map, which was made of strong paper and hung next to his desk. I thought about it. The Red Army was making its way even further eastwards, we were becoming further and further distant from our supply bases, ever more unfavorably for the fighting requirements of our divisions. There were no proper roads and only one single-track railway. Resupply was becoming increasingly difficult. A strong cloudburst, such as we experienced more than once since the attack began, was sufficient to leave the heavily laden trucks stuck in the mud. The Army's transportability hardly sufficed to bring up the required items such as ammunition, fuel, food, etc., over these wide expanses to the fighting troops. If the fuel supplies failed, the attack could often be delayed for days. The chief of staff raged, but the senior quartermaster responsible was powerless. The fuel convoys we had ordered were repeatedly diverted south to Army Group A, shortly before reaching their intended destination. Protests by the senior quartermaster, even by the Army's commander-in-chief, were not taken into consideration. I was summoned by Paulus. His quarters consisted of a porch, a large room, and a smaller room. He worked in the larger room. A simple right-angled table served as his desk. There was a chair on one of the long sides. A blackboard had been set up behind Paulus's working space, and on it was pinned the situation map. The commander-in-chief's personal orderly officer was responsible for keeping the map up to date. Paulus was standing in front of the map when I entered the room. The Army Group's Chief of Staff, General of Infantry von Sodenstern, rang me a few minutes ago. Colonel General von Weeks will be taking off in about half an hour. He will be visiting us. The Chief of Staff has already ordered a cross to be marked out on our landing field. You will collect the Colonel General in my car from there, drive off straight away, and check that all is in order at the landing field. My driver is on his way to your tent. The Auxiliary Landing Strip in the area best protected on the steppe, was not far from the village in which the army headquarters were located. On the edge of it stood a Junkers 52, some courier machines and some storks that were used by headquarters. 
I waited with the commander of our air staff near the edge of the landing strip, which was marked out with white clothes. The machine soon appeared, flying very low. It crossed the airstrip and came into land. Out stepped a large, gaunt general wearing horn-rimmed glasses who looked more of a scholar than an officer. I reported myself as the 6th Army's first adjutant. Although we had never met each other before, he greeted me like an old acquaintance, nodded at the others standing around and climbed into the waiting vehicle. At headquarters, he had a long conversation with Paulus and Schmidt. Later, I heard from our army commander-in-chief that it was about the difficult situation that the 6th Army was in since the withdrawal of the 4th Panzer Army. The colonel general showed understanding and said that he would provide any possible support from his side. Paulus said, of course, he cannot give us new divisions. He will, however, take care to ensure that our units that are deployed on the Don to protect our northern flank are replaced by the following allied armies as soon as possible. The headquarters of the 17th Corps are to remain there. Then we will be lacking a corps headquarters. The 8th Corps headquarters cannot possibly command all the infantry divisions of our northern group, I venture to say. The withdrawing headquarters will be replaced by 11th Corps headquarters. The commanding general is General of Infantry Strecker. Paulus added, I know Strecker very well. He previously had the 79th Infantry Division that supported us near Karka. He is a man that we can leave things to. The tasks of Army Groups A and B were set out in Order No. 45. Upon what assumptions were the Army High Command and Wehrmacht headquarters operating? In the first section of the order it said, only the weakest enemy forces of Timoshenko's army have been tasked with completing the encirclement and reaching the southern bank of the Don. This was obviously a completely false interpretation of the results of the summer offensive. Few prisoners taken, almost empty battlefields, and only a few dead. These were the actual facts that Order No. 45's assessment clearly contradicted. Then the goals of the further operations were set out. Army Group A was to go with part of its forces into the Western Caucasus and thrust along the Black Sea coast, take the Makop and Grozny oil fields, block the pass routes over the Central Caucasus, and finally advance to Baku. The order went on to Army. Group B, as already ordered, falls the task after building up the Don defenses in the thrust on Stalingrad, of defeating the enemy forces being built up there, of occupying the city itself, and of blocking the peninsula between the Don and the Volga. In connection with this, fast units are to be deployed along the Volga with the task of thrusting towards Astrakhan, and similarly blocking the main arm of the Volga there. While Order No. 41 had foreseen that the forces of both army groups would reach Stalingrad and then conduct the further operation, Order No. 45 demanded the simultaneous fulfillment of all these tasks. That is, the extension of the front from 800 kilometers at the beginning of the summer offensive to 4,100 kilometers at the completion of the planned operation. This inevitably meant that the striking forces of both army groups would be split, although our already recorded losses had in no way been sufficiently replaced to meet such an extensive task. This instruction altered nothing of the 6th Army's task, after the withdrawal of the 4th Panzer Army of occupying the Big Don Bend to the south, which was our next goal. Yet again, we had moved our headquarters forward. While my section followed with the vehicles, I myself was flown ahead in a Fiesler stork. We soon reached our destination. Below us lay one of the usual spread out steppe villages of small, single-story wooden houses with flowery front gardens and fenced in yards along the wide, dusty main street. At the landing ground, I was awaited by the army headquarters commanded. He gave me some brief information about the village and drew my attention to a low, sturdy brick building, which stood out. He wanted me to follow him there. Do you want me to accommodate my section here? He shook his head. No, I want to show you something. Let's go in. Through the open door, I saw a laboratory. On the table stood tripods, bottles and beakers, test tubes and microscopes. In a white glass cupboard lay pincers, syringes, and scalpels. My further glance around fell on glass containers that apparently contained chemicals and various bottles filled with liquids. Finally, I discovered a swarm of white mice and guinea pigs. How did this laboratory come to be in this steppe village? What role did it play? 
Our commandant did not know either. On the way to the headquarters accommodation, we met the first general staff officer. I told him of our discovery. He too could make no sense out of it and wanted to task the chief interpreter to solve the mystery. The latter discovered from an old man that the inhabitants of this village were involved in the forefront of cattle breeding. The state had built the laboratory for them. It was directed by a veterinary surgeon who, together with her female assistants, had taken the cattle to safety away from the village when the German troops approached. In the days to follow, I went past this small veterinary medical research laboratory. Several times, always one of the old remaining villagers was around. Apparently, a kind of guard had been organized, a sign of the value the farmers placed on this establishment. But we now had time to think about how communism apparently had a good side to it. The next days gave us a communist surprise of another kind. On the 25th July, several staff officers were sitting down after eating together. The chief of staff had already gone off to his quarters. Then a signaler appeared with a radio message, which the IA officer took. This produced a donner wetter from between his teeth before he jumped up and hurried after the chief of staff. What was up? The 14th Panzer Corps had come up against strong enemy units in a further thrust towards the Don southwest of Kamensky. A bitter battle had been raging for hours, but the enemy was not giving way. That evening, the 24th Panzer Corps, which had recently joined the army, reported the same. It was supposed to support our list corps blocking the way to the lower chair. In doing so, it had come up against a strong enemy defensive front near Nishinshurskaya. The infantry divisions reported enemy resistance west of the Liska stream. Once the various reports had been entered on the situation map, it was obvious that the Red Army west of Kalash had established itself in a wide bridgehead stretching from Kaminsky to the mouth of the Chur. Our court had tried to break through the Soviet defensive front on the move and to throw the Red Army back over the Don. But they were biting on granite, and not only that, the Soviet divisions identified weak positions on our side and went into a counterattack on the 31st July, throwing back our already badly decimated divisions over the Liska River. For several days, there had been a bad atmosphere in the 6th Army. The enemy, moreover, was able to get some large units across the Don to the south near Kriminskaya and place them in the rear of the 14th Panzer Corps, which had to turn several regiments to the north to counter this move. The 14th Panzer Court now stood widely dispersed along the Don north of Kaminsky. Those infantry divisions of the 6th Army west of Kleskaya, which had been relieved by the slowly following Italian 8th Army, could now be released. The 8th Corps closed the Soviet bridgehead from the northwest with its divisions, having contact with the List Corps on its right wing. The southern end of the lower Chur was blocked by the 24th Panzer Corps, in this setting, the 6th Army repulsed the enemy attacks and simultaneously prepared to smash the Soviet bastion. By the end of July and the beginning of August, the Italian 8th Army was so far advanced that it could relieve the 6th Army's divisions deployed west of Kletskaya to protect the northern flank. Some of the 14th Panzer Corps regiments deployed in a security role were relieved by infantry divisions from the 11th Corps. These drove the enemy back and formed a defensive position. While preparations for the attack were being made, the 6th Army headquarters received various high-ranking visitors at its location in the steppe village. The most interesting one for me was an encounter with the Wehrmacht's communications general, Fel Giebel. I got to know him through our Army's chief of signals, Colonel Arnold. That evening, the three of us walked to and fro along the village street. The general started speaking about the war situation. His appraisal was somewhat skeptical, almost pessimistic. We too had many concerns, but they mainly arose out of our own situation, from this or that episode in our army's area, perhaps too about the Eastern Front, Felgebel. Though had doubts about the whole war, in the West our troops stand widely separated from the North Cape to the Pyrenees. Rommel is fighting in North Africa. In Yugoslavia and Greece, our divisions are conducting an exhausting little war against partisans. And what happened last year in front of Moscow, you know for yourselves. Hopefully all goes well for your army, I can understand. Hollis is concerned about the long-stretched northern flank. If only we had not undertaken this offensive. Several times I cast a glance at Arnold, like him. 
I closely followed the words of the Signals General, who continued in the same quiet voice. Germany now has a two-front war. We three were there already in 1914 to 1918 and know from our own experience how we were bled dry then. Have the circumstances improved since 1918? I would strongly doubt it. I listened attentively. There was a hardly concealed mistrust in the war planning of the high command, a criticism of Hitler, disbelief in final victory. Could Felgebel be disagreeing with Hitler's conduct of the war? He was speaking against the two-front war. What alternative could there be? The general turned towards me. How high have the losses been up to now? The losses from enemy action have been within reasonable boundaries. In contrast, the numbers of sick have been very high because of the climatic conditions with which we are so unfamiliar. The fighting strengths of the infantry companies are frequently reduced to a third or less, and the hardest fighting is yet to come. With that is no happy prospect, the general ended the discussion. It was a lovely summer evening. In the distance, a sheet of lightning flashed against the darkening sky. I breathed in the refreshing evening air. Suddenly, I shivered. I then realized that I was still wearing a thin summer jacket. I quickly went to my tent. My Batman had already laid out my bed and blacked out the small window. I switched on the electric light, powered by a generator, and sat down at my desk. But I was not thinking of working. The general's words were more powerful. They sank in, forcing my thoughts along their track. Actually, Felgebel had only said what anyone would have said after sober reflection. General Felgebel flew off again the next day. None of us suspected that he would have a role to play in the conspiracy against Hitler on the 20th June 1944. Perhaps he had been looking for fellow conspirators among our staff and found no resonance, but we still had to go through much horror and bitterness in order to get correctly to the bottom of the military situation not to mention the human and political crimes of this war. At that time, our heads were filled with the preparations for the attack on the Soviet bridgehead west of Kalach. General, Paulus had hardly any time free to devote to his friend Felgebel. If he was not absolutely committed at army headquarters, he was driving out to the divisions and regiments. He was trying to build up a personal picture of the situation and the mood of the soldiers at the front in order to improve their lives as much as possible. He mainly returned apparently silent. He was very depressed with the growing losses of troops that were already occurring even before the decisive battle. The forthcoming operation, the endangered northern flank of the 6th Army, and the sinking fighting strength of the companies were the main themes for his discussions with Major General Schmunt, Hitler's chief adjutant, who landed in his Fiesler Stork on our provisional landing ground, Paulus and Schmidt, included me in the discussions at times, I reported plainly about the worsening personnel situation. Schumann should also have an immediate impression of the frontline sectors that the 6th Army was preparing with the greatest concern. Therefore, Paulus drove with the chief adjutant to the divisions on the northern bank of the Don, east of Kletskaya. Here, it had not been possible to throw the enemy back across the Don. Our divisions had only occupied an observation position there in order to conserve their strength. At the headquarters of Infantry Regiment 767, 376th Infantry Division, the commander, Colonel Stadel, described the situation. On its left wing, the regiment had contact with the Italian 8th Army, which had just occupied its positions. Stadel was one of our best commanders, personally brave, circumspect, and esteemed by his soldiers. Paulus had known him since the First World War, and was aware that the colonel also had no inhibitions in dealing with his superiors, Stadel was also not embarrassed, despite the presence of the adjutant from Fur headquarters, to criticize the dangerous situation on the northern flank into which the 6th Army would be maneuvered. The division's losses in the last days had increased once more. Most companies now had only 25 to 35 men carrying arms. Paulus told me later that Stadel had forcefully demanded reinforcements. While Major General Schmunt was still with us, the Luftwaffe reported that the enemy were bringing reinforcements across the Don near Kalash, especially tanks. This was yet another argument to demonstrate to Hitler's adjutant the necessity of bringing forward reinforcements as soon as possible. Laden with the burning demands of the 6th Army, Schmunt flew on to the Army Group and from there back to Fur headquarters. 
Paulus brought him personally to our airstrip, and while saying farewell, again asked him to obtain an effective securing of the northern flank from the Army High Command. Another prominent visitor at this time was General Oshner, chief of the smokescreen troops. A smokescreen mortar brigade was to be attached to the Army for the attack on Stalingrad. These mortars had seldom been used by the Army High Command. I had got to know them for the first time in the attack on Veliki Luki. Their rounds raced with long fire trails and unbearable howling through the air. Even our infantry, who had been told about them shortly before, by the mortar company commander, anxiously ducked their heads as the rocket, like rounds, flew over their positions. The effect on the surprised enemy's morale was enormous. Even after the town had been taken, many of the Soviet soldiers remained as if paralyzed. General Oshner was only with us for a short while, one or two days. He discussed the tactical use of these weapons with the chief of staff. Upon his leaving, Paulus said to him, Hopefully this does not turn out to be an empty promise. You have seen how relentless the fighting has become here. The enemy no longer gives way under our pressure. He defends himself obstinately and hits back whenever he can. We definitely need the horrors of your mortar brigade. Oshner departed with the words, you can be assured that I will not leave you in the dirt. That was generally how we dealt with our visitors. Each time it cost us considerable time and strength to inform the generals. The superior establishments had now material and knowledge enough to confirm our alarming reports. Our first general staff officer, Colonel Volter, said Schmunt was apparently impressed when we returned from the drive to the front. What he had seen with his own eyes and heard on the spot had shocked him somewhat. Hopefully, he will not hold back the truth from the Fuhrer, so that at last the talk about the destruction of the Red Army will end and the enemy will be taken. Seriously. As I see it, I said, above all, General Felgebel saw it clearly. In the discussion that Arnold and I had with him, he pointed out the whole situation on the war fronts more earnestly and soberly than I could have done myself until now. How General Oshner is involved, I do not know, as I only exchanged a few words with him. One can only wish that at last the truth will reach the high command. As already mentioned, the 6th Army was to screen the northern flank of the Panzer armies thrusting forward to the Volga. Order number 41 of the 23rd June 1942 gave it the new task of taking Stalingrad in cooperation with the 4th Panzer Army. As flank protection in the area from Kletskaya to north of Koratoyak, the Allied armies were deployed in order from the west, the Hungarian 2nd Army, the Italian 8th Army, and the Romanian 3rd Army. What did we want from the Allied armies? We knew that they had been formed into independent army formations shortly before the 1942 summer offensive had began. Only a small part of the newly formed armies in the rear area of Army Group South, with effect from the 7th July 1942 Army Group B, had combat experience. Equipment and weapons were in short supply. In view of this, the Romanians and Hungarians were advised completely the Italians partly, to turn to the German armaments industry. How does it help if, when push comes to shove, the northern flank has the strongest anti-tank weapons and the Allied armies are totally lacking in heavy tank-busting weapons and heavy artillery? For example, the Romanian tank, the division was equipped only with captured light, such and French tanks. In comparison to the German divisions, the fighting strength of our allies amounted to only 50 or 60%. Clearly, in view of their insufficient armament and equipment, these armies could never withstand an attack by an enemy equipped with T-34 tanks. But this applied not only to their weapons, it applied even more to the soldiers. Using them, Romanian divisions since 1941 had proved successful in the aggressive fighting in the southern sector. The soldiers were brave, disciplined, and unassuming, being mostly farmers. As long as they were still fighting near their home boundaries, the war had had some sense for them. Then one or another had been tempted by the soil in Bessarabia, or in the territory between the Nestor and the Bug, which Hitler had promised to Marshal Antonescu as Transnistrian. Perhaps one could be a free farmer there. This was not possible in the old Romania of the great landowners, but what was the Romanian farmer, soldier doing between the Don and the Volga? Then there were the unbelievable conditions in the Romanian army, 
such as corporal punishment. My friend Adarul told me that he himself had once seen a Romanian soldier beaten and mistreated by an officer. Such things did not raise the fighting morale of the Romanians, and this showed particularly when the going was hard. General Paulus regarded the Romanians highly and also had confidence in the Hungarians. But he had fought against the Italians in the First World War, and knew them too from an inspection that he had carried out as senior quartermaster of the army headquarters in North Africa. He took it as being especially necessary to place them within the strong corsets of German divisions. The fighting morale of the Italians was certainly influenced by their living even further away from the Soviet Union than the Romanians and Hungarians. If it was 1,500 kilometers from Bucharest to the Volga, and 1,900 from Budapest, the Romans and Milanese were fighting almost 3,000 kilometers from their homeland. Fighting for what? For Greater Germany. It was quite understandable that they should have little liking for it. The ways and means adopted by the German high command to deal with the weaknesses of their allies only strengthened their mistrust. As already said, our allies were almost totally dependent upon Germany for their heavy weapons and a large part of their equipment. In fact, they received little enough. Therefore, it was firmly stated in Order Number 41. For occupying the more and more extending Don Front in the course of this operation, the Allies' units will be in the first line to be called upon, with the stipulation that German troops are to be inserted as strong supports between the Oro and the Don, as well as the Stalingrad Isthmus, the rest of the individual German divisions remaining available as front attack reserves. All this contributed to the Allies slowly taking up their sectors. The Hungarian 2nd Army, which had carried out the attack on Voronezh, took over the securing of Donau as far as Novaya Kalitva in conjunction with the German 2nd Army. At the end of July and the beginning of August, the Italian 8th Army replaced those infantry divisions of the 6th Army in the area from Bogutshar to Kletskaya that were urgently needed for the attack on the Kalash bridgehead. The German 18th Corps came under the Italian 8th Army. The Romanian 3rd Army was now on its way, the Italian troops temporarily having to take over the area allocated to them, widely separated from each other. The inadequately armed and ill-equipped allies now stood on the Don. There were insufficient forces to construct a continuous position. This was no defensive front, rather only a thin security line. This could not remain concealed from the very active enemy. No wonder that the army headquarters looked anxiously to the north. Should the Russians take advantage of the weakness in our deep flank, we will be in a more than unpleasant situation now. Um, look at how the front runs, it is like a clenched fist. Really devilishly unpleasant, General. The enemy only now needs to apply the scalpel to the wrist and the fist is off. Let's hope that Schmunt is presenting a true picture of the situation at for her. Headquarters. We told them clearly enough. Let us hope further that our allies get the heavy weapons they lack. The coming weeks would bring us the most bitter disappointment for all our hopes. For days the Luftwaffe had been reporting that the Russians were reinforcing their bridgehead west of Kalach. Its regiments got a bloody nose when they attacked the Soviet bridgehead east of Surokino. Meanwhile, however, some of our divisions had been replaced by the Italian 8th Army and moved into their temporary areas. Infantry divisions took over the northern bank of the Don from Ostrovsky to Kletskaya in the sector occupied by the 14th Panzer Corps, enabling the Panzers to move into the attack north of Kamensky. During the first days of August, the 76th and 295th Infantry Divisions, which had come under the 17th Army until then, were brought forward to reinforce the 6th Army's right flank. On the 6th August, the preparations for the big blow against the Soviet bastion were completed. Our units had taken up their launching positions and were supplied with sufficient ammunition and fuel. According to the reports, lying before us on the enemy side were 12 rifle divisions and 5 tank brigades. Their line of retreat across the Don had to be blocked. They were to be surrounded and destroyed. The operational plan allocated both Panzer Corps the task of erecting a barrier on the Don. The 14th Panzer Corps had to thrust forward from the Kaminsky area to the Don, the 24th Panzer Corps from the Nizinchurskaya area to the Don. Early on the 7th August, the earth groaned under the weight of the tanks rattling forward. The morning silence was suddenly broken by the exploding of shells, 
and torn by the whipping of the belts of machine gun fire. Our tanks were able to break through the Soviet defensive positions. The spearheads of the two attacking corps met within a few hours. Then, however, the real fighting began. Our attacking infantry division struck a skillful and bitterly resilient enemy who had immediately recognized the threatening danger from the German tanks and, fighting with their backs to the dawn, counterattacked the Panzer Corps. The latter fired whatever was in their gun barrels, nevertheless, elements of the Red Army were able to cross over to the east bank of the Don. After four days of hard fighting, the battle was over, a great German victory was proclaimed with blasts of fanfares. It did not mention that we had to pay a high cost in men. Certainly the enemy losses were still larger, but left on the Kalach battlefield were numerous burnt out or shot up German tanks, and this was especially bad news for us for our homeland was more than 2,000 kilometers away, making it difficult to bring up replacements. Above all, the Red Army won valuable time for the construction of a new defensive front between the Volga and the Don on the approach to Stalingrad. It was able to stop the 4th Panzer Army, which had already come out of the Zimlianskaya area, through the Kalmyk steppe to Stalingrad south on the 1st August. In order to improve its penetrating strength, the 6th Army had to give up the 24th Panzer Division and the 297th Infantry Division to the 4th Panzer Army on the instructions of the Army High Command. Both these divisions crossed the Don on a military bridge near Potemkinskaya. To make best use of the success achieved at Kalach, the 6th Army should have immediately continued the attack over the Don. But it was not in a position to do so. Again, valuable time was lost. The units had to be reorganized, the lost weapons and equipment replaced, ammunition and fuel replenished. I saw the casualty reports that had been prepared in writing by the divisions. I went myself to those that had suffered the most, among them was the 376th Infantry Division, commanded by Lieutenant General Edler von Daniels. At the conclusion of the fighting it stood together with the 384th and 44th Infantry. Divisions in the Don Ben east of Kleskaya, the three divisions had had the task of throwing the Red Army back over the river. This goal was achieved, but subsequently several Soviet units were able to cross back over the Don at various points and establish bridgeheads. In this fighting our troops had to suffer a heavy toll. Consequently many companies of the 376th Infantry Division had a fighting strength of only 25 men. Things were a little better in the 44th and 384th Infantry Divisions, but companies with fighting strengths of between 35 and 40 men gave no cause for optimism. As the 6th Army approached the Volga, the streams flowed with German blood. The chief successes of the Western campaign were long since passed. Gone, too, was the carefree military atmosphere of the summer of 1941 and the months of May and June 1942. In my journeys in my cross-country jeep I kept coming across stragglers looking for their units after some hard fighting. I especially remember two soldiers who had taken part in the battle near Kalach. They belonged to a division that I was looking for. I took them with me. Still full of fresh impressions of the battle they had experienced, the corporal sitting behind me recounted. I had never smoked so much since I had been in the East. Ivan gave us such a blistering that one could lose one's hearing and eyesight. Fortunately, we had dug ourselves in deeply or nothing would have remained of us. All watch out for the Russian artillery, which operates en masse. Their hits detonated only a hair's breadth from our position. One could only pull in one's head and stick it in the dirt. Many of us were wiped out. We cursed the Stalin organs most of all. Where they landed, it was too late for most to make their wills. His comrade, who I learned in the course of the conversation, by being called up, added, and how their infantry attacked. Their ara would soon have driven me mad. Only their guts and indifference to death brings them on. Is it really only the commissars that make them do it? Standing behind them with a pistol, I have the hollow feeling that there are things about the Russians that we know nothing about. The corporal went one step further than his comrade. He turned directly to me. Three weeks ago, our company commander told us that the Red Army was completely wiped out that soon we would be able to relax in Stalingrad. That doesn't seem to be happening. On the 31st July, they annoyed us more than a bit. 
Only at the last minute were our artillery and anti-tank guns able to stop the Russian counterattack. Will this not end soon, Colonel, sir? Asked the young soldier. It was noticeable that the course of the war was important to him. Perhaps only six months ago he had been singing at school, today Germany belongs to us, tomorrow the whole world. This exuberance had flown away for the moment. Both of them awaited a response from me. I turned round to them. I am no prophet, therefore cannot prophesy, but the war will not come to an end so soon. You have yourselves sensed that the Russians are now heading back. Now we first have to take Stalingrad, and then we will be able to see further ahead. How was the mood in your company? What can one say, Colonel, sir, said the corporal. You will not be angry with me if I speak openly. The war has already gone on too long. Our older ones are longing to get back home. The letters coming from there are discouraging too. The wife of a farmer who had a lot of trouble with a prisoner of war wrote that she no longer knew what to do to get the work done properly. In the towns, especially among the workers' families, food is getting ever shorter. The women no longer know what to do to fill the hungry stomachs of their children. That depresses the spirits. The high losses are also not without effect. When we marched across the battlefield on the 11th August and saw the many dead and wounded, my mate said so that everyone could hear him, we will all perish on this damned, uncomfortable step. He is a good and brave soldier. He got that Iron Cross first class already last autumn. I was thinking over what I had just heard when the vehicle stopped. We had reached the divisional headquarters. With a thank you and a smart salute, the two soldiers excused themselves. So that was how it was in their company. The older ones longed for home and the younger ones had already had enough. Was it the same in the other companies? Once I had obtained a personal picture of the fighting strengths of the divisions, I reported to the chief of staff. Major General Schmidt was not surprised. He knew how hard the fighting had been in the last days. He gave his opinion. The question of replacements is a burning one. Take all possible steps immediately with the subordinate commands, but report to General Paulus first. He has been going round the divisions all day and can surely give you further instructions. Paulus received me with the words, Now, Adam, how is it with the divisions? I now have an apparently clear idea. It is pleasing that many of those taken to be missing have found their way back to their units. Also, a number of the lightly wounded have been sent back to their units after brief treatment by the first aid posts. But what significance does this have when the fighting strength of the companies are down to about 30 or 40 men? We have paid a high price for our success. The hard fighting and the heavy losses are getting on the soldiers' nerves. There is widespread depression. I share Major General Schmidt's view that the subordinate commands must receive replacements as soon as possible. I agree with your assessment and propose measures completely. All the commanders that I have spoken to in the last few days regard replacements as the most important issue. The Russian bridgehead near Kalach was a hard nut for us to crack. Our divisions must be filled immediately, use the teleprinter and state the demands. While I was talking to Paulus, my deputy had been putting together the replacement requests, but the teleprinter to the commands back home had been removed. That night I spoke by telephone with the adjutant of Army Group B, who promised his support. The next day, the deputy commands at Castle, Wiesbaden, Hanover, Vienna, and Berlin gave almost the same replies. Train replacements were unavailable. Recovered wounded declared fit for service by the doctors would be dispatched as soon as possible. Paulus was as surprised by this reply as I was. We knew that Germany had no great manpower reserves after the third year of the war, but in the end, the sixth, Army should have sufficient forces to engage in the main operational goal of 1942. We could expect only a few marching companies from Army Group B. We were grateful for this in view of the impending attack across the Don. Every additional soldiers added to the weight, especially if he had combat experience. But we needed more than a few marching companies. The big city on the Volga had to be taken. Street and house-to-house -house fighting awaited us which we knew from previous experience demanded heavy casualties, were our already badly decimated divisions in a position to cope. Paulus looked at me. What do you propose? Permit me, General, to fly to Fuhrer headquarters at Venitsa. I consider it necessary to report personally to the head of the organizational section about the 6th Army's personnel situation. 
Agreed, fly there very early in the morning. You can then be back before dark. I will use the opportunity to speak to the personnel office about officer replacements. Returning to my tent, I pack my papers for the talks in Venice. Equipped with the latest list of fighting strengths and officers post, I went early next day. Shortly after sunrise, to the western exit of Asanaka village where we had established our headquarters. Under the cover of some trees and bushes, camouflaged from the air, stood the army staff's courier aircraft. One of them would take me to Kharkov. It was already ready to leave. I had hardly climbed aboard when the engine started up. A few minutes later the machine was racing down the step track and rose from the ground. We flew at a low height. The rising sun was still low in the eastern sky, shedding its light on the endless steppe. The drops of dew on the arid grass glittered like pearls and diamonds. It was a wonderful sight, but there was something rather sinister about it. The wonderful flying weather was not quite without its dangers. It offered enemy fighters several advantages with clear sight and the sun behind. Things could go badly for us in an attack. The pilot could not fail to notice my careful look to the east, but he grinned. Don't worry, Colonel. When our fighters are in the air, no Russian yak dare be around. Do you see those sparkling points over towards the sun? They are ours. They will dive down on the enemy like birds of prey should he dare appear. We flew over the route that the army had taken in the last few weeks, but in the opposite direction, only seldom was a village to be seen. For long stretches we flew over the main road on which convoys laden with supplies were streaming eastwards. The escort teams waved at us. Here and there in the seemingly unending steppe appeared destroyed tanks, guns, or abandoned trucks. The trench systems that only shortly before had been occupied by Germans and Russians were clearly seen. Often my eyes fell on the corpse of a fallen Red Army soldier or a horse with its legs grotesquely raised up. Down below, thousands of German soldiers and officers had breathed their last, and their loss was the reason for my flight to Venezia. While their stiff bodies were buried by comrades in foreign soil, no one found the time to care for the dead Soviet soldiers in the same way. After making an elegant curve, the pilots set the machine down on the runway. Slowly, it rolled up to a Junkers 52 standing nearby with its engines running. It was the courier machine to Venezia. Our army headquarters had radioed through from the steppe village to the airport at Karko. They were waiting for me. I was aboard within two minutes. Several couriers had already taken their seats. The engines roared and the machine started off. It quickly gained height. The flight to the west offered a richly varied picture. The fruitful fields of the Ukraine stretched to the horizon, crisscrossed by strips of woodland, rivers, and streams. The network of settlements was considerably thicker here than in the first stage of my journey. Long, stretched out villages alternated with smaller and larger towns. Our pilot wanted to maintain a height of about a thousand meters so we could easily see the transport columns rolling eastwards along the many roads. More conspicuous were the trains steaming towards cargo, carrying supplies, ammunition, fuel, weapons, and equipment. Kharkov was the supply center for Army Group B. After just two hours, we landed without incident at Venezia. A car took me to the personnel office, which was in the town. There I had a long conversation with General von Bergsdorf. The advance to the Don had taken a heavy toll of young infantry officers. But Army Group was unable to fill the gaps. I understand your concerns, said von Bergsdorf. But at the moment, we can hardly help at all. The other units of Army Groups A and B also have large requirements. We need several hundred company and battalion commanders alone. Training courses have been underway for several weeks, but apparently will not end until December. Until then, I can assure you that we have a full understanding of the 6th Army situation, but currently it would only be possible to support you at best in individual cases. That is poor consolation, General. Consider again what you can do yourselves within the army. Check what suitable non-commissioned officers you have to put forward for commissioning. Perhaps other possibilities will offer themselves to compensate for the lack of officers in the infantry. I am thinking of certain young army officials in the rear services. Incidentally, what does it look like with the youngsters in the artillery and the signals detachment? At the moment, I have no sufficient overview. 
But a short while ago, the commander of the Army Signals Regiment was complaining to me about his potential officers having no chance of promotion. Once I am back, I will have all the Signals and Artillery units report their potential officer candidates, but not many will stand out. Once I had spoken to the section commanders for Panzer and Engineer officers, I went to see the head of the organizational section, Colonel Miller Hillebrand. This section was also in the town, not far from the personnel office, hopefully. I would have a bit more luck here. I entered the building with these thoughts. Like everywhere in the fur headquarters, all passersby were carefully checked. The duty officer read my pass through at least twice, checking the seal and signature, looking from me to the photograph. Then I was reported to the section leader. You are coming to me about replacement questions. I know your urgent requirements. Miller Hillebrand greeted me with these words. I said that he had presumed correctly and placed the latest documents that I had brought with me before him. I described our predicament in detail. Before flying here, I contacted the deputy commands, all replied that worthwhile replacements are not available at the moment. I want to say frankly that we at 6th Army Headquarters have the impression that the Homeland Departments are underestimating the difficulty of the task facing us. How can we take a big city of about 300 square kilometers with companies of a fighting strength of 30 to 40 men? After our last experience in the Big Don Bend, we can expect the enemy to defend every house, every stone. While I was speaking, the chief of the organizational department was leafing through my papers. I looked at him expectantly. We know how it looks to you, and you can be assured that I would very much like to help you. Unfortunately, it is really just as the deputy commands at home have said. The newly called up replacements will not complete their training until the end of December. Reinforcing the infantry regiments is not possible before January 1943. I looked at Muller Hillebrand in shock. The offensive on Stalingrad was due to begin now, not in January 1943. What would then happen if our units were not even up to half strength? The colonel noticed what was going on inside my head. Tell your commander-in-chief that I will do everything I can to help him. In the coming months, we can use some soldiers that have been released as healed from the field hospitals. I will ensure that the marching companies assembled from them will go primarily to the 6th Army. I very much regret that I have not the slightest chance of doing more. I said farewell. In the whole of the war, I had never been so downhearted as now, when I had to take the flight back to headquarters. I got to the courier machine to Kharkov just in time. It was filled to almost the last seat with couriers, specialists, Wehrmacht officials, and commanders of units returning from leave or training courses. A seat had been reserved for me immediately behind the pilot's cabin. A lively conversation was going on around me, but I hardly heard it. It did not suit me being the deeply defeated person that I had become after the experiences of this day. Had the Army High Command and Army General Staff really believed that we could advance more than 600 kilometers without suffering considerable losses, Army Group B had not been able to bottle up and destroy the mass of Soviet troops at all. The enemy had been able to withdraw over the Don and would doubtless give us plenty to do in the forthcoming fighting for the big city on the Volga. What kind of war planning was this that set powerful strategic goals but forgot to prepare the timely commitment of men, weapons, and equipment? At every war school, it was taught that breaking through a well-constructed enemy defensive position demanded considerable casualties from the attacker if it were to succeed. Already in the First World War, the Russians had shown themselves masters of defense. Had they forgotten this at Army High Command? Had not immediate measures been introduced when the first heavy casualty reports from our attacking army were presented? Had we not early enough briefed Hitler's chief adjutant, Major General Schmunt and Generals Felgebel and Oschner, on the worsening fighting strengths, advised them urgently enough of the threatening situation that must inevitably arise if there were no reinforcements? We had received nothing but words, and nothing was done. More than ever the thought tormented me that the enemy was underestimated by the high command in an irresponsible way. What would happen if further casualties were incurred in the forthcoming fighting? Were there any divisions on our 1,000-kilometer front that could be drawn upon without the front being torn apart? I had still found no solution when the machine landed at Kharkov Airfield, where there was lively activity, with connecting flights standing ready to fly off in various directions. 
A pilot from our staff was waiting for me. We immediately took off and were in Osanaka by evening. I went straight to General Paulus from the landing ground. His face was strained and fatigued. His formerly erect figure was bent forward. I could see how heavily the burden of responsibility lay on him. Now, Adam, what did you achieve at Fur headquarters? Without using a lot of words, I reported on the depressing outcome of my flight. I forced myself to control my own anger and disappointment. So it seems I have to take Stalingrad with fought-out divisions, said Paulus. Bitterly, as I completed my report, Muller Hillebrand assured me that the forthcoming March battalions will be allocated in preference to our army. Of course, that is far too few. One has to accept, however, that the Army High Command is concerned with the timely relief of our exhausted divisions if sufficient replacements are unavailable. I myself did not believe in that possibility, but wanted to say something that would not further weigh down the threatening situation. But Paulus did not let it pass. No, Adam, that is illusory. Where would those divisions come from? We have already talked often about the question of reserves. Hitler does not want to know about it. Carelessness and superficiality already seem to have made their mark on the planning of this offensive. We can therefore make no reproaches. We have done everything within our capabilities. From the first day of the offensive, we have been reporting truthfully. You know that I have never underestimated the enemy, and I have not held back my warnings from Schmunt, Felkebel, and others. That I can confirm to the best of my knowledge and conscience, General. The fighting at Kalach showed us that the enemy is no longer prepared to give up ground without a fight. Our soldiers are exhausted from the physical and mental stresses of the last days and weeks, and technical equipment and weapons have been lost in considerable numbers. Now exhausted troops that have not had a day off for seven weeks have to start a new attack. I know all this myself, General. I painted our picture at Venisa in the blackest colors, Paulus reflected. Then went on, General Blumentritt, my successor as first senior, quartermaster in the Army General Staff, is on an inspection journey to the Eastern Front. He has also reported to me, I will describe everything to him. If there is any way, he will certainly help us. Once I had left Paulus, I quickly sought out the Chief of Staff, who was already expecting me. I knew that Schmidt would not give in so quickly. Once he had heard my brief report, he blustered. Our infantry have marched fighting over 500 kilometers. What that means, the gentlemen in the Army High Command seem to have forgotten. Nevertheless, everything too tightly drawn tears apart the bow. Despite everything, Adam, we are not going to hang our heads. I trust our brave soldiers, of course they complain, but when the order to attack comes, they march, I am convinced that we will attain our goal. Do you think, General, that the forthcoming battle will result in fewer losses? No way. For the crossing of the Don, we have in any case allocated two divisions that are almost up to normal strength, the 76th and the 295th. I have given them the last of the March battalions. Their commanders are reliable. In addition, you will have heard from the commander-in-chief that General Blumentritt is visiting us. We will be speaking clearly to him once more. General Blumentritt had arrived at Army headquarters, the last preparations for the attack on Stalingrad across the Don was complete. The divisions were waiting in their ready positions. Paulus and Schmidt discussed the conduct of the attack with him once more. The commander-in-chief expressly stressed that success could only be assured if every threat to the 400-kilometer northern flank was eliminated. Blumentritt obtained a very instructive impression of our endangered situation from this meeting. On the 19th August, the 6th Army's orders to attack went out to the generals. Commands, that afternoon I was at Major General Schmitz for a conference. In his office hung greatly enlarged aerial photographs of Stalingrad. For the first time I saw a clear representation of the city, which was marked only by a small cross on our maps. It extended for more than 60 kilometers in a 4 or 7 kilometer wide strip along the western bank of the Volga. I had not realized how big it was until now. The question immediately arose, will we be able to take this vast city? In the first attempt of the move, the enemy already knows our intentions. While we were fighting for Kalach, the Russians had set out, as our airmen reported, several belts of fortifications with anti-tank ditches. While we were having to put 
our forces in order and regroup. He had gained another 14 days. Despite reinforcement by the 24th Panzer Division and the 297th Infantry Division, the 4th Panzer Army had been unable to thrust across the Volga south of the city. Our current attack would in no way come as a surprise to the Russian High Command. What you say is quite correct. If we can punch through with a clenched fist to the northern edge of Stalingrad and the 4th Panzer Army simultaneously enters in the south in a further attack, then the enemy will have to fight on two sides, about 60 kilometers apart. Whether they are in a position to do so, I have strong reservations. We have thought through all the variations. Ammunition and fuel is available in sufficient quantities. Without doubt the high command of the Red Army has used these last four weeks or so to bring forward reinforcements, clear, the factories, evacuate the civilian population, and prepare the city for effective defense. That will bring us some hard fighting, but I am convinced that we will soon achieve it. Listening to Schmidt, it seemed possible that our headquarters had taken everything into account. We expected some hard fighting with apparently also heavy casualties, but in the end victory would be ours. I left the conference with the army orders and went to my tent to study the documents in detail. In my mind I could still see the aerial photographs of the city on the Volga. Stalingrad was of great strategic significance. It was the connecting link between the Caucasus and Central Russia. Once we had the city in our hands, the enemy would be cut off from the cornfields of the Cuban and the oil wells between the Caspian and Black Seas. One of the Russians' most important traffic routes would be broken at its strongest junction, but what if we were unable to take the city in the first attack? Reconnaissance of the terrain had shown that the sector of the Don between Lutshinsky and Ostrovsky offered a ready starting point for the 6th Army's attack on Stalingrad. The western bank was wooded thick bushes and deep ravines in the steep bank running down to the Don offered wonderful camouflage, enabling the positioning of equipment and the construction of tank-carrying bridges right up to the river's edge without the enemy being able to see them. In addition to this, from the west bank, we could see for kilometers over the flat eastern terrain. Paulus described the plan of attack to the commanding generals at headquarters. He had the intention to use the corps, to which the 295th and 76th Infantry divisions were attached, to form bridgeheads on either side of Vertiashi east of the Don, and from these to thrust to the Volga north of Stalingrad with the 14th Panzer Corps. After breaking through the enemy defensive line, the List Corps should protect the left flank and the 13th Corps, the right flank of the tanks storming through to the Volga. The 11th Corps should remain to provide flank protection in the Don. Then between Melov and Kletskaya, while the 24th Panzer Corps, with only the 71st Infantry Division at its disposal after giving up both the 44th Panzer Division and the 297th Infantry Division, would form a bridgehead near Kalach and attack eastwards from there. The army's headquarters had been as busy as a beehive over the past 10 days. Orderly officers came and went, messages were sorted and evaluated, commanding generals appeared for personal consultations, pilots reported on their observations, conferences took place continuously. Now there was an expectant hush. What would the next day bring? This question was the central point of our table talks on the 20th August, I can hardly think, said the first general staff officer, that the crossing will cost large casualties. The enemy position is easily visible from our side. Our artillery has the ranges, the infantry and engineers have been carefully instructed. After a short artillery preparation, the assault craft will cross the Don. By the time the Russians come to their senses on the other side, we will be on the opposite bank. If everything goes smoothly, agree, I said, but if our artillery does not cut off all their machine gun nests, then the crossing will be really expensive. Two days ago, a divisional adjutant told me that he himself was on the river bank and saw where the enemy had carefully camouflaged their nests. It was particularly difficult to pick out the nests lying immediately on the river bank. Schmidt said, don't worry, gentlemen, it won't be easy, but we will soon do it. Whereupon he left. I had already long before sought out two old regimental comrades that were with the 76th Infantry Division. Who knew whether I would see them again after the forthcoming battle, I had therefore quickly asked permission from Major 
General Schmidt to drive to the 76th, of course you can go, Adam. Greet General Rodenberg for me. I wish him all the best. Arrange your journey so that you are back before nightfall. The time dragged. Within 15 minutes, I had driven off in a cross-country vehicle. Despite the heavily congested road, we made good progress. The black dust that the motorized vehicles were throwing up was very troublesome. In overtaking a convoy of trucks, we plunged into a thick cloud of it. The driver tried to speed up, but soon the windscreen was covered in such thick dust that he had to stop. I climbed out to brush the dust off with a cloth. I had to laugh when I saw him through the now shiny glass his face was as black as the ace of spades. The driver was no less amused and invited me to look in the mirror. I did not look any different. The dust had penetrated every crevice in the vehicle. Even the engine was covered with dust a centimeter thick. Going forwards was almost impossible. We therefore turned off the road and drove across the step by compass. Several times streams obliged us to turn back onto the road to get across a bridge. Here chaos ruled an inconceivable throng. Dozens of ammunition trucks were trying to reach their artillery positions before nightfall. Jeeps and horse-drawn carts were rushing forward. In between motorcycles twisted their way through. Engines, horses, and humans caused such a din that one could not understand a single word. I reached the headquarters of the 76th Infantry Division between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. Hours, it had been set up in a small wood immediately behind the regimental preparatory areas. In front of the tents on the edge of the wood stood the desk of the divisional commander. Major General Rodenberg was leaning over the maps on which the lines of attack and objectives were shown. Next to him stood his first general staff officer, Lieutenant Colonel Breithout. I directed my driver to drive right up to the table, which caused the Lieutenant Colonel to approach us angrily. Who was daring to bring a vehicle up so close? Then he recognized me. With pleasure. We had not seen each other since the autumn of 1936. At that time, we were company commanders in the same battalion in Giessen and Worms. I had always got on very well with Breithout a farmer's son from Thuringen. Rodenberg greeted me, it is good that you visit us for once. We have already often spoken about you. If you had come here an hour earlier, you would have met General Paulus. He chatted with us for a long time. Previously, he had been to the 295th Infantry Division. Was the commander-in-chief content? We think so, yes, answered Breithout. He had us report exactly how the attack would be conducted. Then he approved our orders. He had me escort him to an infantry regiment in the front line and finally visited an artillery observation post. How do you rate our chances of success, General? You know that I am an optimist. Without doubt, our preparations could not have remained completely concealed from the enemy, but we will soon get it moving. Until now, I have always been able to leave things to my Brandenburgers. Breitopt added, Paulus spoke to the sappers up in front. Everything is ready. As soon as we have driven the enemy back from the river bank, the sappers will immediately begin constructing the bridge. Until the bridge is ready, the tank hunters and artillery will follow the infantry on ferries. Artillery observers are going forward with the first attacking wave. You can see that everything must go well for us. We will also be breaking strong resistance. What is the atmosphere among the troops? Breathe up? Paulus asked us the same question. How can I answer? You should go to the regiment, Adam. They can tell you themselves. We are happy with our soldiers. It was really time to drive on to Abraham. If I wanted to be back at our headquarters before dark, I said goodbye to Rodenberg and Breithout. As I was climbing into the vehicle, I was wondering whether everything would go as the two of them thought. Certainly Breithout was a competent chap, but the enemy knew what stood ahead of him. The Russians have certainly not become idle, a messenger from one of the regiments that had been detached to the divisional. Headquarters accompanied me, a lively youngster with flashing eyes. I asked him, so how is it in your regiment? Willingly, he replied, we hope that it will start soon and we can get to Stalingrad. At last, we have been tramping enough and are enjoying our longer rest period. We have had enough of the step. One does not find any proper accommodation at all. In France, it was nicer, and we would all like to go back. Will you make it to Stalingrad? Our regiment, Colonel, has not yet refused anything. With the last replacements, many old soldiers returned to us. They complained 
but if anything happens they are there. Most of them have been wounded several times so they are proper. Frontline pigs on whom our colonel can depend. That is fine, then nothing can go bad for us. There is the regimental headquarters, colonel. The soldier pointed to a still young wood in front of us. Abraham was already waiting for me, Bredithopt having signaled our movements. We had not seen each other since the beginning of the war. Already, in greeting each other, I noticed that he had changed little, or was he only giving that impression as he greeted me somewhat flippantly? Adam, I was already thinking that the army adjutant had forgotten his old comrade. How can you say something like that? You know what has been going on with us these last few weeks. Only today, before the attack begins, has there been a bit of peace. And I immediately used this opportunity to visit my old friends. Are you content now? It was not meant seriously, old chap. I am delighted that we can see each other again at long last. How lovely it would be if we only had one of the bottles of beer that we emptied so many times together in Trier. But in this dried up step, there is never enough drinking water. We slipped through the light wood towards the dawn. There was not a soldier to be seen. Only painted signs showed that dozens of units had been here. Telephone cables hung from the boughs of the trees. Mortars were hidden in the bushes. Once we had crossed the wood on a beaten path, we came to a wooden shield fastened to a tree. Regimental commander's command post was written on it, with an arrow pointing to the dawn. We now came to the edge of a deep cleft. It leads directly to the river, explained Abraham. That is an eroded valley, a so-called Balka. I have heard of them. Today is the first time I have seen what such a gorge looks like. It is astonishing what work the water has done. One could accommodate a whole company in it. And more, in this Balka at least two companies have had ample room. There are at least half a dozen such gullies in my position alone. An observation post lay before us in a thick clump of bushes. Beyond it, the ground fell steeply to the river, on whose dark flood the evening sun was mirrored. Over the opposite bank, my view went far across the steppe. Behind, there must be a big city on the Volga. I looked through the telescope. Is the east bank occupied at all? Of course, but the Russians have camouflaged themselves so carefully that hardly any of them is discernible. By day, nothing moves on the bank. But they have their machine gun nest there. We have tried offering them suitable targets, but they whistle at them. Not a shot is fired. Not even at night when it becomes livelier over there. We have identified some nests. I'll point the telescope for you. Do you see the nest in the crosshairs? I looked through it. It took at least 10 seconds for me to identify the machine. Gun position. When I turned back to Abraham, his face seemed to have changed. The derisive expression on his face had disappeared. His lips were pressed together. His eyes looked at me earnestly, quite rigidly. If our heavy weapons don't completely smash the enemy positions, the river crossing will cost us a lot of men. We have discussed the coordination of artillery, mortars, and sappers in detail. Nevertheless, there remains a big question mark. I would bring the infantry guns far enough forward for them to be able to destroy the newly advancing enemy in the direct line of fire. That has happened, and you can see them for yourself. I am interested in something else, said the regimental commander. How is it with replacements that are certainly so necessary before the forthcoming fighting? That is a dark chapter. The newly conscripted recruits will not be trained until the end of December. We must just hope for good luck. Evening was approaching, it was high time that I was making my way back, but Abraham wanted to show me the artillery positions. One had to recognize that the regiment had not treated them lightly. The guns were well camouflaged and had a wide and free field of fire. Slit trenches for the crews, piles of ammunition, and immaculate positions. Everything done exactly according to the fighting instructions. Abraham remarked that there was a certain fatigue and exhaustion detectable among the soldiers. There was also some complaining, but that was typical of soldiers who always complain about something or other. And how is it with you personally, Abraham? Nothing special. The regimental doctor wanted to put me in hospital a few days ago. Of course I refused. How would it look if the commander left his regiment in the muck shortly before an attack? What is wrong then? The doctor wanted to send me to a specialist because of my nerves. I can hardly sleep anymore. I am as if shattered during the day. 
but now we have to get across the Don. Let me know immediately if it gets worse. You will be no good to the troops if you collapse. And now, for tomorrow, all the best. It had already become late when I climbed back into my vehicle. Will we reach our headquarters before nightfall? I don't think so, Colonel. The sun has already vanished and the night comes. Here very suddenly, said my driver. We can at least reach the supply route before dusk. We must go to the west of this village to reach it, I said, with a look at the map spread out on my knees. Again, we were smothered in a cloud of dust. Even in the half-light of the departing day, the journey was no easier than on the drive here in the afternoon. As we moved against the stream of traffic, coming towards us were trucks, field kitchens, and horse-drawn carts that we had to avoid. So we crept forward, often having to stop, driving in the first and second gears. I must have been quite a time lost in my thoughts when the driver's voice gave me a start. Colonel, I think we have lost our way. We should have been on the main road a long time ago. Danny, yes, my luminous watch showed 6.30 p.m. It was already dark. The oncoming traffic had disappeared without my having noticed until now. Angry with myself, I had a stop. We were standing on a road that was overgrown with steppe grass. Heavily used stretches no longer had any grass. There was often black, powdery dust here in the daytime. So we must have got onto a little used road. What now? Turn around. Five minutes later, we reached a crossroads. I looked with a pocket torch for our car's tracks, but it was a hopeless task. There were vehicle tracks everywhere. At that point, some white flares went up not far from us. With the help of my compass, I established that they had been fired to the east of us. That was where the front line must be. Apparently, we had taken a route that ran parallel to the Don. I instructed the driver to keep going north. At some point or other, we should come across the main road. It did not take long. Until a light blinked at us, we drove up to it. It came from a truck that had broken down. The two soldiers with it, who belonged to a 76th Infantry Division. Supply unit told us that we were on the right route. We reached the main road. After about 1,500 meters, we progressed only slowly. It was 11 p.m. before we reached our headquarters in Osanaka. They were already concerned about us as the 76th Infantry Division had reported our departure. It was no longer possible to think about sleeping. I reported my impressions. Paulus, too, was happy to have returned from his journey. Our opinions were that all preparations had been made to ensure the success of the offensive. The clock showed 2 a.m. I lay awake on my camp bed. The light was switched off. The fresh night air came in through the open window. The moon touched the little room with its weak shine. Or was it the dawning day already? I looked at the clock 2.30 p.m. Another 60 minutes. Unrest gripped me. I left my quarters and went to the first general staff officer. Practically all of the headquarters staff were present. Once more, the time was confirmed with the general staff. Then General Paulus also entered the room. It was time. Punctually at the fixed time, the thunder of the guns ripped through the quiet of the yielding night. It provided the horribly exciting overture for the thrust over the dawn. Following a short bombardment, the assault and inflatable craft were put into the water with infantrymen and sappers. Smoking a cigarette, Paulus sat at a map table, his face twitching. We were all tense like this. What would the first reports bring? The first general staff officer had gone directly to the telephone exchange. He was in constant contact with the Corps, which was leading the attack. It seemed to us an eternity before he finally returned. The talking stopped and all eyes were directed expectantly at him. General, the first report from the Corps, the 295th Infantry Division has reached the opposite bank and is advancing further. Few losses. Of the 76th Infantry Division, only one regiment has crossed the Don. The attack by the 2nd Infantry Regiment was repelled with heavy losses. Numerous inflatable craft and assault boats have been lost. The commanding general has gone to the 76th Infantry Division. What has the court done to help the regiment? asked Paulus. The report was passed by an orderly officer. I know no details at the moment, but will go immediately to contact the Corps Chief of Staff. Silence reigned in the room, apparently. What Abraham had told me the day before on the steep bank of the Don had come to pass. If our heavy weapons don't completely smash the enemy positions, 
the river crossing will cost us a lot of men. Confirmation of this was brought by the first orderly officer, who had already entered, the 76th Infantry Division, has just given the reason for the failure of its regiment advancing on the right. When the boats of the first wave were already two-thirds across the river, they were hit by murderous defensive fire coming from some excellently concealed machine guns and mortars. The regiment has suffered severe casualties, the boats have been sunk, only a few soldiers were able to swim back. The court ordered the 295th Infantry Division on the opposite bank from the right-hand sector of the 76th Infantry Division to relieve them by making a thrust in the enemy rear. Paulus agreed with the measures taken by the court. He told the orderly officer, The court is to report when the regiment's attack is resumed. The army staff officers went off to their offices. The news soon came through that the renewed attack by the infantry regiment had been successful. The enemy was being rolled back, thus both divisions of the court were able to form. Bridgeheads on the eastern bank of the Don, which quickly repulsed. Hefty attacks by the enemy. Meanwhile, the sappers were working feverishly at constructing the bridges. To enable the 14th Panzer Corps to take part in the attack on the Volga, bridges were being built near Peskovaka and Vertiashi. On the 23rd August, the 16th Panzer Division, as well as the 3rd and 60th, Motorized infantry divisions went into the attack from the Don Bridgehead. In the early hours of the morning, they broke through the enemy defensive line and advanced over the range of heights north of Mal Rasoshka G-137 Kani Halt, reaching the Volga north of Stalingrad in the evening of the same day. This thrust formed a 60-kilometer-long, 8-kilometer-wide corridor. It went so quickly that the infantry divisions could not follow up fast enough and were unable to prevent the Soviet units closing up their defensive front behind the 14th Panzer Corps. The Panzer Corps was cut off for days with a massive counterattack, especially against its unprotected flanks. It was in serious trouble. It had to be supplied by aircraft and convoys of trucks. Loaded with wounded, the vehicles broke through the Soviet lines towards the Don under the protection of the tanks. At the bridgehead, the wounded were handed over to the main dressing stations. Afterwards, the most important supplies were loaded up and under escort by the tanks, the trucks returned the same way to the Corps. The latter was unable to take the northern part of the city by surprise. It stood for days, isolated from the army, engaged in heavy defensive fighting on all sides. Only after a week, following the introduction of further infantry divisions in the bridgehead, was it possible to break the enemy resistance with hard fighting, despite many casualties, and to establish a continuous connection with the Panzer Corps. The 8th Corps then took over the protection of the army's northern flank in the area between the Volga and the Don. The army order described this sector as the land bridge. The headquarters of the 8th Corps followed immediately behind its attacking divisions. The quartermaster department had also crossed the Don and lay in tents, not far from the newly constructed bridge near Peskovaka. This bridge was attacked every night by Soviet aircraft. It was a disastrous position for the tents. At the end of August, I received a telephone call from the adjutant of the 8th Corps. He reported an hour ago a bomb hit the tent in which the quartermaster and the officers of his staff were holding the conference. The quartermaster and several officers are dead, all the others severely or lightly wounded. The Corps urgently needs replacements, Otherwise, the supply system will be imperiled. Before informing Paulus and Schmidt about this by telephone, I asked our exchange to connect me with Army Group B. Hardly had I informed the two generals when the telephone rang. It was the Army Group. The duty officer took the message and my urgent request for replacements. Already the next day, the requested replacements appeared. But it was not only about the replacement of the quartermaster department. The enemy was attacking the 8th Corps without pause on the land bridge. We suffered heavy casualties in the fighting south of the Kotlaban. The Corps also reported increasing casualties. It had to cover the right flank of the 14th. Panzer Corps and attacked the city on the Volga via Rosashka and Gumrak. But it was only slowly gaining ground. Counterattacks by the Red Army from the Rosashka Valley forced the Corps onto the defensive for several days. It was the same with the 71st Infantry Division, which had managed the crossing of the Don on the 25th August near Kalash. 
but had then become stuck. Likewise, the 4th Panzer Army that was supposed to take the southern part of Stalingrad failed to achieve its goal. 